in the business rather than, well, I just want to make some money now, right? Um, and the, the, the thing here about the big why is, is that I've had people who said, well, you know, I want to make enough money for my kids to be able to go to, the, to a good college, right? And so they make enough money and their kids go to a good college. And then the question is, so now what? Right? So now what? Right? And so um, being in real estate is actually simple, although not necessarily easy. Right? There are a lot of moving parts and there are a lot of things to learn, but what I've noticed over the years um, is, is that the two things that determine whether or not you're going to be successful is, number one, you have to have a desire to do it. Right? That means everybody says they want to make money, but not everybody wants to work to make money. Right, I've, 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 it's, you know, it's like my comment. I used to, uh, I used to be a member of a, of a of a health club, a gym, and it didn't work. Right, you know, it just didn't work. Right, obviously they they didn't know what they were doing. Right, because I joined and I I never got into shape. Right, of course I never showed up. Right, I never actually worked out. Right, and I could say if you said do you want to lose weight, do you want to be in better shape, I'd say sure I do, but I wasn't willing to get up in the morning and go to the gym and work out before I went to work. Right, so the desire has to be sufficient to result in a commitment to do the things you need to do to be successful. Hmm? Right. The second thing you need to be successful in real estate is a willingness to learn. Br smartness is not necessarily correlated to success. Education is not correlated to success. Age is not correlated to success. But those two things, the desire that equals a commitment and a willingness to learn, are what are correlated to success. Right. I've seen people that started in real estate that look good, sound good, had good, talked good, and did absolutely nothing. And other people who didn't look good, didn't sound good, didn't talk good. One agent that I had hired, I remember the broker had said, well, you know, I have trouble understanding her. She seems to have trouble talking. And in two years, she was the number one agent at our office, right? Because she wanted, she got up and she went to work and she did it, right? Just, just thought I would share that little insight, which is why we spend some time playing things like the Power Hour, which you can find online. And um, it's, you're going to find that working with buyers, working with sellers, there was an agent that I recruited, went through my school, joined the office, and I'm coaching, who fired a client yesterday, right? Because the guy would make offers and then back out and then make offers and then back out and would essentially lie to the agent about what he was doing. And he could never figure out what the buyer's motivation was. Right? And you understand if the motivation isn't there, the buyer's not going to buy. If the seller's motivation isn't there, the seller's not going to sell. If your motivation isn't there, you're not going to succeed. And the one thing we cannot teach is motivation. You understand? Well, I don't have a class for motivation. Right? I've been to classes on motivation, <laughs> but I don't know how to teach it. Right? The only motivation is self-motivation. Sometimes motivation comes with success, right? Michael Gerber in the ebook, and I know I've said this before, but I have very limited material, so I repeat myself. Michael Gerber in the ebook said a lot of people say that if you're motiv more motivated, you'd be more successful. And he said, How about this? If you were more successful, you would be more motivated. So what I'm suggesting is, and I realize that when you're doing Ignite and you're just getting started, there's lots of overlapping things, but what I'm suggesting is, is that you do what we suggest for 90 days, right? Five days a week for three months, right? 90 days. And what I know will happen is you, if you actually do that at the end of the three months, you're going to have probably escrows, right? And when you start getting 10, 12, and $20,000 checks, you might find you're more motivated, right? I'm just, right, you understand? So even if you say, well, I don't really know why I'm doing this. I just didn't want to have a real job, right? This is the only place that I, I can, you know, I remember, I'm not going to go into that, right? But uh, there was a scene from Paul Blart, Mall Cop, right? You know, a great movie. I don't know why he didn't get an Academy Award, where he, he, asked, he asked this guy, why, what, bring, what interests you in security or security guards? And the guy said, well, it's the only place that, would hire me without a high school diploma, right? You know, so, and I'm not saying it's that bad, but there's some people in real estate just because they don't want a real jump, right? So, so what do I mean to do what we say 
for 90 days for three months. This is what I mean, right? That you put 10 people into your database every day. If you don't one day, you make it up the next day. And that you prospect, which means, that's a dirty word, right, that we just threw in there. It connect with 10 people every day. You follow up and write 10 notes and you preview 10 homes every week. Right? I'm suggesting that you do that and you write down your milestones. You track what you do every day to make sure you're reaching those goals. All right? And so these are sort of the things you want to know every day. You made how many calls, how many connections, got how many referrals, and got how many appointments. When I worked for the photocopier company, they had a sheet we had to turn in every day that had similar information on it, and zero was not an acceptable number, right? Zero means you get fired. The reality is, you know, 20% of the agents make 80% of the money. It's actually higher than that. Most people in real estate, if you had a real job, right, a real job, and you spent as much time at that real job as you do at the job of real estate, you'd be fired, right? For most people in the business, if that was a real job, they'd be fired. Right, because they don't spend enough time doing the things they're supposed to be doing. Right, if you were working at Home Depot and you spent 80 to 90 percent of your time talking to friends on your cell phone and going on break, they would fire you the first day. Right, but we are free and independent, aren't we? So that's one of the reasons the people that succeed in real estate treat it as a job. By the way, the, one of the top agents in this office pays himself a salary every month from his checks, right? So his commissions go into the bank account, and from the bank account he takes out a draw every month, and the other money he leaves there, right, for investment, down markets, and other things, right? You, you, you understand, whereas most many agents just spend the money. All right, um, so that's just a suggestion. There's lots of moving parts. Most agents, you see, this is sort of a good and a bad thing. Most new agents don't go through any kind of a training program at all, right? I'm, I'm not kidding. And most of the ones who do go through training programs do not go through very good ones. I happen to know. I have used to work <laughs> for a company that had one of those training programs. So um, the good news is, is that we're going to at least spend the time to show you what you need to do. Our problem is not figuring out what you need to do to be successful. Do right? you understand that is not the problem? Our problem is finding people willing to do it. Right? That's the problem. So about getting your head in the game, the win for you. And one of the Keller Williams, um, and this is on some wall in the office I know, is uh, one of our mottos sort of is win-win or no deal. The win for you is to learn what to say and do to make and receive offers that win for both you and the buyer and the seller. And for your customers and clients, um, buyers and sellers will feel as though they both won and will rave about the level of service you provided to ensure a smooth and handful. One of the reasons that people hire agents is to negotiate for them. Right? Do you understand if the owner were there and you were a for sale by owner, right? And so the buyer comes in and the buyer sees the carpets are ugly, right? I had a listing and the guy had, I called it bordello red carpets, right? This sort of a off, sort of a combination of a burgundy and a rosé, right? Which he was very proud of. Everybody hated his carpets. Now, if you're a for sale by owner and you're showing property to buyers, are they likely to tell you that they hate your carpets? Probably not, right? Probably not. Right, because they don't want to be rude to you. Will they tell their agent why what they don't like about the house? The answer is yes. Could their agent tell your agent that you need, if you'll replace the carpets with a neutral Berber, right? You have a deal, right? You understand that that kind of negotiation. That's why agents are hired because they can negotiate. Um, get, get your head in the game. Arriving at the offer stage is an exciting and rewarding time. Yeah. If you represent the buyer, you have found the one. All you have to do now is close. If you represent the seller, you've marketed the property and you have an offer from a prospective buyer. All right. Which is, these are both good things. 
This is one of the several critical junctures you'll encounter during the countdown to payday and offer as part of the process of moving from a buyer to an agreement, from a seller's agreement to a sales contract. The process and offer I'm just gonna, is the part of the process of moving from a buyer or seller's agreement to a sales contract. So the buyer's agreement is called like the buyer, buyer representation agreement, the buyer broker agreement, the buyer loyalty agreement, the buyer service agreement, the, right, whatever you want to call it. I've given you copies of that. Um, and the seller's agreement is called a listing contract, right? So we've moved to where we actually have a real contract. Which contract, you said, which contract do agents get the most use out of? Listings or purchase contracts? And the, just so you understand what I'm saying, is a, does a, a listing, is a listing an offer to sell real estate? If I've listed the home, if I've offered it to sell? For sale, really? So if I'm sitting in my office and I have a listing on your house and Donald Trump comes in and he says, I hear you have a listing on this property. Can I see it? And I say, well, yeah. And I pull out the listing and I hand it to him and he reads it. And he says, this looks great to me. He turns the listing agreement over and writes, I accept. Signs his name, Donald Trump, dates it. His chauffeur's a notary, stamps it. And I call you up and I say, congratulations, I just sold that property you have out in the country to Donald Trump. And you say, what do you mean you sold that property? Chevron just called. They found oil under that land. They're offering millions for it. Has your house been sold? The answer is no. So a listing is not an agreement to sell real estate. right? By the way, this is one of those things that is a very fundamental issue. If you're in real estate, like if you're a plumber, you need to know that water does not run uphill, right? Do you understand? If you don't know that, they won't let you be a plumber. Did you know that they won't let you be a plumber? Because the word plum, right, actually has to do with level. Anyhow, so a listing is not an agreement to sell real estate. It's not an accept. You understand? If it were an offer to sell real estate, it could be accepted. If you can't accept it, it's not an offer. What is a listing? It's an agreement to pay a commission. That's it. What about the market of property? It's an agreement to pay a commission if the broker uses diligence in trying to find a buyer. Right? Whatever that means. So all the listing is is an agreement to pay a commission if you find a ready, willing, and able buyer willing to purchase the property under the exact terms of the listing or another price in terms that the seller accepts. But an offer... A purchase agreement is an offer, it's an acceptance, right? Um, it affects title, there's something called specific performance. You could record one if it was signed in the presence of a notary, right? Do you understand? Which, if you said a real estate agent, which would you rather have, a signed listing or a signed purchase contract? I would rather have a signed purchase contract. So, do you understand, we're getting, this is a big thing. How about this? This is what real estate agents are actually paid to do. Are you paid to get listings? Are you get like $500 every time you get a listing? Paid to show homes? 25 bucks a house? Paid by the mile? Paid by the, mi no, paid by the word to give advice? Do they pay you by the word? Pay you by the hour? All right? What do, what do they pay you to do? They pay you to get buyers and sellers to sign contracts. And I would add to that a good contract. And a good contract, by the way, is not necessarily a legal one. It's simply one the buyer and the seller both want. Right? Many contracts that close, real lawyers could rip apart, which is why they don't sell real estate. Because right? they'd be ripping apart the contract. Buyers and sellers have to both want it. Then it will close. Isn't that, what's the title of this class? Negotiating Win-Win Agreements. Uh, Chris Heller, mega agent and president of KW Worldwide, San Diego, California, admits that everything he's learned has been doing it the wrong way. The one lesson that stands out the most for Chris is the importance of setting expectations. Always under-promise and over-deliver. Whether you're, you're working with buyers or sellers, set the expect expectations conservative, therefore reducing the chance of disappointment. Don't tell them they have a great offer and you know it's going to be accepted. All right? Don't. All right? Tell them you're going to work at it. All right, what we're going to try to do today is walk through the process about writing and presenting offers, learn how to receive offers, practice scripts. I know you guys like that part the best. Learn how to set the stage for positive negotiation and walk away with a plan of action. 
Affirmation for the day. Have I mentioned that it would be good to have affirmations? Is motivation and mindset important in success in sales? I am a great real estate agent and people respect me and want to work with me. All right, you ought to put things like that next to your phone, on your computer. Um, leverage E-Edge. One of the things that I'm not going to cover but which we have videos on and that you're going to need to learn how to use is the E-Edge has what's called E-Signatures, which is the ability in, to get documents signed without you actually being there. There are reasons why you might want to be there, but as you're going to see, that's not always going to be possible. Right, and it's called eEdge. It's called My Transactions, and you'll notice when you log into eEdge that I think I let me just why don't I just go when you log into eEdge? Is this uh, what happened to my other one? How about here? All right, so come on. Anyhow. Um, I think I've showed you how to find the training, but notice it starts with my leads. This is a demo, so hopefully your number is going to show things, right? Uh, emails that have come through eEdge. Marketing is ways of marketing things. Action plans are task controls. My transactions is where you would start a transaction. So if somebody goes through the process, right, you can manage the transactions using the eEdge software and it has built into it an e-signature program. There is one that comes free with the zip forms, the California Association of Realtors forms called Digital Inc. It's not very good. Right? I used to teach classes on Digital Inc and people would just, it was a painful thing. There's a better one called DocuSign which is exactly what pretty much the one we use looks like and it's relatively easy to use right we is there a fee for that? we there's no fee for you pay a fee to be at keller williams that fee includes the use of the e-signature but docusign is a is a fee-based system right see and I, I know of offices that say well we don't charge anything every month but they don't give you any of the tools either and when you go out and you start buying the different things that you need it's hundreds of dollars a month Right, from third parties. So that's all integrated and um, you, there's training available on it. I'm not going to go through that right now. I will spend a little bit of time on the California Association of Realtors forms because, well, you'll see why. Okay. Um, so a buyer has found the home they want to purchase and the seller is looking forward to concluding the sale. This is when the fun and magic begin. Sometimes it's black magic, but it's magic. And whether you're representing, it's an opportunity for you to shine as a real estate professional. Um, people will sometimes argue about little things, right? This is um, the negotiation of the contract. When buyers and sellers, remember that home buying and seller National Association of Realtors 2011 survey, right, that I sent everybody a link to. If you read what, why do buyers and sellers hire real estate agents, one of the things that you're going to find that is high on the list is negotiation. Right? right? Very, uh, that's high on the list. Negotiation. And good negotiation skills can do a couple of things. One, it can get your client what they want. But two, it can help close the transaction when things are going bad. Sometimes things go bad. Um, buyer makes an offer. Seller responds in one of three ways. Now, that's accept, reject, or counter. When I worked with sellers and I had an offer, I would tell the seller, you have one of two choices. You can either accept the offer or you can reject the offer. And then the sellers would say, well, well wait a second. Isn't there like a, a third choice? I mean, can't I counter the offer? And my answer would be, that's a rejection, right? How many of you remember from real estate school, a counter offer is a rejection, right? It kills the offer. It cannot be res resuscitated after that. So a it's a rejection and the seller making a new offer. Um, 
All right, so if they accept the offer, that begins the contract to close process. If they counter, you go back and negotiate. And if they reject, the buyer agent, con con the buyer agent contact contacts the listing agent to learn more. Don't assume no means no. All right, I've had people write uh, with a marker pen rejected. Oh, the owner did this just to get across the, the contract and fax it back. Right. They didn't actually click on the box. They just took a big marker pen and wrote rejected and faxed the front back to me. We eventually closed on that transaction. Right. Um, when you represent the buyer, once your buyer finds a property they want to purchase, there are three actions you need to take. Prepare to write the offer, write the offer, and present the offer. Now, we're working on scheduling Mike Sibilla to come and do two sessions on writing the offer. Right, it's planned to happen in November at this office. It probably will not be the mornings of Ignite, right? Because he has a much busier schedule and it may not be. Um, we're gonna let everybody know when he's doing that and you should be there. The bro who, do, who reviews offers at our office? Who's in responsible for their content? The broker of record and that's Mike Sibilla. Right, and even though he knows that I've taught this before, plus we have Mr. Barry sitting here, he wants to do this class personally. So he reviews every contract that every Keller Williams agent has sent and sent a slow Pretty trial. much, yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, we have team. We have other people that look at it, right? But and most of the time there isn't much to look at. But if there's something funny about it, something special, right, with it, then he's the one that would look at it. So do you understand he, even though he's a, a busy guy and has other people that could do it, he wants to personally do it. There's a reason for that, right? He wants to tell you how he wants the contracts to be written, right? Which is a good thing. It's much better to hear this before you write the contract than hear it after you've written the contract, right? You would not believe some of the offers that I've gotten on houses. You just go, oh, my God. I how did they get their license? Well, because to get a license, you don't need to show that you understand contracts or how to write an offer, right? That's not a requirement to get a license, is it? Did they ask you to fill out a form? Did they ask you to read a form that was filled out? No. All right, before you write an offer, be sure you're fully prepared so you can work quickly and efficiently when you actually begin writing it. Use the checklist below. Let's take a look at this. The checklist, obtain the buyer's pre-approval letter from the lender. Right now, uh, if it's a one or two paragraph letter, you might want to talk to the lender because as a listing agent, I wanted to see what the conditions were because there's no pre-approval that's absolute. They'll say, oh, you're pre-approved, but we need to see this and that and if and what and, uh, and there's a list, right? And a good pre-approval will usually have that list. Will the lender talk to you? Yes. Uh, now, first of all, if I was writing it for the buyer, I would have my loan agent's business card and uh, tell the listing agent to give him a call and have a chat, right? If you have any questions about the buyer's financing here, call and have a chat. The loan agent will, uh, is going to be willing to do this. I, I can't, I've never heard of one that would not. If you find one that says, no, I don't want to talk to anybody, then you need to find another loan agent. But they're going to explain. And do you understand having somebody other than you and the buyer say that your buyer can afford to buy a house uh, helps, right? They know the difference between pre-qual, which you could get off of the internet for a dog, right? You understand? A pre-qual letter, you could log into a website, type in Skippy Jones, right? And they'll say, how much money does Skippy make? And you say two hundred thousand a year, you know? Does he have any debts? No, right? You understand? And pretty soon you'll have a letter for the dog that says they can. The listing agents know this. So the purpose for talking with the agent is to determine the subject to conditions. All right. First, the loan agent is what I mean. My, by the way, the first thing we're, we're these are things you need to prepare. We're going to talk about what you actually do. But the listing agent, first of all, whether they call or not, are going to feel more comfortable that you made the offer that they could talk to the loan agent. 
right? And if the listing agent has multiple offers, they might call the loan agents to talk to them about just how confident they're feeling about those particular people, right? right? And, and in terms of, so when they're talking to the seller about which one. But this needs to be locked up by the time you're doing an offer. Ensure that the property is still available. First thing you do is you call and ask the listing agent. You say, hi, my name is Mike. I'm Gunnar Williams. I have some clients that are interested in making an offer. Is the property still available? Right? Because sometimes you're going to find this hard to believe, but real estate agents sometimes don't change the MLS right away. Right? They don't get, they, they, what? Three times, right? They don't change that. They, they're not, so what? Right? You understand? The, they, 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 it takes a while before they're going to get fined, right? But they're, they're not necessarily in a hurry to do it. So you need to call and say, do you, is it still available? If they say yes, ask, do you have any offers? I would ask, are they good? Are they above? Tell me about them. And by the way, as a listing agent, I would probably answer. Because if I had two offers that were above the listing, my job as a listing agent is to get the most money for the seller. And if you call me up and say, do I have any offers? I might not tell you what the highest one is, but I'll say, yeah, and they're all above list price. Right? So if you're thinking of writing one, I just want you to know I've got two that are above the list price already. Right? One of them's all cash, right? Right? And then, and then, well, but you understand? And then uh, my job, uh, first of all, don't lie about this, right? I knew an agent who did that, and then they all went away, and they didn't really have an offer. And you don't want to, well, you don't lie, and don't say that you have an offer that you don't have, right? Because you're going to find that buyer's agents will call you and say, we're making an offer, and the buyers will change their mind make an offer on another property, right? So I'm talking about ones that you've received that you're going to present that you have physically in your possession. But you would like to, you should ask, I asked as many questions as I could get away with, why are they selling? Really, where are they moving to? Why are they going there? That's, I hear that's a nice area. Do they have family there? Right, you know, they have a new job, right? You understand my job as an agent for the buyer is to find out as much as I can. Uh, even if your MLS indicates the listing is active, contact the listing agent and ask them. If it's off the market, let your buyer know immediately before you start to show another home. All right. I, I would do this, do this before you write up anything. Pro produce a comparative market analysis to educate your buyers. Do your own CMA. I have suggested that you use something called the Realtor Property Resource. And although I don't know when I can do a class on it, what I'm doing is I'm going to Google videos. I mean, not Google. I went to Google Voice. Wrong one. Going to Google video search. And I'm going to write in realtor property resource. And let's see. I'm going to hit long because I'm looking for a training video. Realtors property resource and Reggie Nicolay. Um, utilizing the Realtor Property real Resource, um, Realtors reap the benefits. Um, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's um, other ones. So some of them are not, but there are several that you're going to find that explains how to use the Realtor Property Resource. The reason I'm mentioning that is it produces, a, it has a really nice format for preparing an offer. It actually has a template designed to give to a buyer who's going to make an offer on a property. Right? An RPR. RPR. Yeah. Right. And the other thing is if we were to go back to our Google search here and we were to type in RPR, um, some of them are not this, but um, the one, well, I've watched this one by Reggie Nicolay who actually works for the National Association of Realtors, at least he did at the time. And he, um, anyhow, I'm just saying there's no excuse for not learning how to use this, right? And notice that's a really long video. 
right? And there's other, so you, you, you can figure this out. I'm telling you that this is the nicest and easiest way for you to prepare a market analysis for the buyer so the buyer can come up with a accurate offer, right? They can't just lowball. However, that also doesn't mean that everything is not, that everything's underpriced either, right? I saw a listing the other day that I think is like 80000 over, right? And, and so offering the list price is a bad idea, right? But the only way you would know is for you to do a market analysis. I have suggested that you try to do this before you show properties. Because while you're looking at the property, you can discuss whether or not that listing price is high, low, or on the market. Right? It makes you sound like you know what you're doing. Right? Heaven forbid. Contact the listing agent to build rapport and gather as much information about the sale of the property as you can. Do you have any inspections? Do you have any reports, any disclosures? Right? The fact that the MLS says they don't doesn't mean they don't. If you assume that real estate agents, listing agents, update the multiple listing service as soon as they get new information, you're wrong. I'm not saying they never do it, but you understand if when I put the, when I put something in the MLS as a listing, I may, I may not have a termite report. But we, if they're my seller, we'll get one. But now that we've got one, have, am I necessarily going to remember to log into the MLS, find that field, and click on the box that says we have a termite report? Probably not. I might not do it. Right? You understand? Why? You know, I don't know. Right? But if you asked me, what do you have? I would say, oh, well, I have a termite report and I have the... Right? You'd like to look at these before you make an offer. What kills transactions is negotiating in the middle of them about repairs and the condition of the property. The number one reason that transactions fall through is fighting between the buyer and the seller in the middle of the transaction about the condition of the property. Which is why when you represent the seller you want to get, I would get everything. All the inspections and reports. I listed a house in the Silver Creek area that was five years old it had a chimney. The buyers bought it brand new, the sellers, which are now the sellers. They have never lit a fire once in the fireplace. They're not into fireplaces. They had a flower arrangement in the fire. It was pristine. And I suggested that they get a chimney inspection. And they were all, we really never, and I said, we're going to get a chimney inspection. They got a chimney inspection and there was a defect in the chimney that was made by the builder right, which was still under warranty, right, and it was over $3,500 to fix it, right. Now, if we hadn't done that, if I had represented the buyer, they're going to get a chimney inspection on a brand new house even, right, I, because they build them with bad chimneys, right. I get termite inspections on relatively new homes. I've had people say, why? They're termites at the lumber yard, right, running around. Brand new homes have termites, right? They come with the wood, right? So do, do you understand if you represent the seller and you don't want to be fighting and have the transaction fall apart, you get every report. And if you represent the buyer, you want them to get every report or you want them to sign something that says that you've explained it to them and they realize that, that you think it's a big mistake, but they're not going to get the report anyhow, right? Do you understand? Because later they'll sue you and say, you never told me to get that report. Right? I've had asbestos inspections. I've done, I mean, I'm, and asbestos, by the way, there's asbestos everywhere. I'm just, and it looks like a Geiger counter. The guy's got a little box and, and it makes noise. And it's just like all the time beeping. And my buyers are like freaking out. So he walked, <laughs> he walked out and he held it down to the sidewalk and it really started to go off. He walked out on the street and held it down on the street and it just went nuts. It just went nuts. And he said, yeah, it's, everything's got asbestos. He said, this isn't bad. You know? So they ended up buying the house. But do you understand, does everybody understand that, that 
you really want to find out if they've got anything. Do they have a copy of the transfer disclosure statement? The seller, there's a seller disclosure, statutory disclosures. You want every piece of paper you can get from them. And you want to show it to the buyers when you make the offer. And if there's stuff there they don't like, don't write up an offer. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but you know, right after the big earthquake here and, and uh, I was too young. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many houses that had damage to the chimneys. They didn't, you couldn't tell it on the surface. Most of them, some of them you could. But most of them you couldn't tell until you had the chimney inspection. But they were just, it was amazing. And, and, and chimney inspections are, uh, if they've been using the chimney, they probably have creosote and tar and flammable material stuck in it that can catch on fire, If even if they haven't used the chimney. The, you want it. But does everybody understand you, your job is to start, because sometimes a listing agent isn't going to do this, right? And so there's nothing. Now, what you have to explain to the buyer is that they're going, they really need to get all these. If they were buying a business and investing $800,000 in a business, would they want audited financial reports? How much does that cost? A lot. A lot. A lot. More than $1,000? It costs about $10,000. All right, more than 1000 They could get every single report you've heard of an inspection for under a grand. Right? They probably get everything that you've ever heard of. This and buyer's, buyer's expense. expense. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. And will they be reimbursed? And the answer is that's not what the contract says. Nope. Could you write that in? Uh, you could, but um, if there's multiple offers, you're not going to get the house. Right? And then what will happen is the listing agent now has all the reports for the next guy. <laughs> And the seller didn't have to pay for them. It's just the way it is, right? Do you just, have to give them the, the seller copies of the reports? Yes, you're, it's in the purchase agreement. You have to give the seller copies of the reports. All right. Um, so, but you, you, but you understand, if they were buying an $800,000 business, they would spend more than $1,000 investigating it. If they're buying an $800,000 house, they should be willing to spend some money to investigate it. And if you're the listing agent, by the way, these things can be billed to escrow. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. If you're the, this is why I would tell sellers, you don't have to pay now. We order all the reports. It's billed to escrow. It comes out of the funds that the buyer, right? Why don't we raise the price of thousand dollars? Huh? How about that? Right? Just re nudge it up a little bit. Now you get your money back. But we don't want to argue about this in escrow. Yes. So then you should, first you do the offer, and then after it gets accepted, when, when you order all that stuff. Right, you don't order it before, you can't do it before you have a contract, but the, what we're saying here is you want to get from the listing agent everything you can that they have and show it to your clients before you write the offer, Right. Because they're going to see you. What, what's the worst thing is, is that they're, you're in escrow and now they see things they do not like. And now they want the seller to do this or to not to do that, right? It's a lot easier. So also you should find out, by the way, this information, how much the seller paid and how much they still owe, you can get that from the MLS real list and the realtor property resource. You should also ask. Sometimes there are seconds that don't appear on the prelim, right? There, sometimes there are, but you want to ask, how much do they owe, right? Because if they are underwater, it's going to be a short sale. By the way, I've had agents who listed homes, and they asked the seller, how much do you owe? And the seller told them, and they figured out the price, and so it wouldn't be a short sale. And the seller was wrong about how much he owed. And the amount that he owed made it a short sale, which means now, in order to sell the property, you have to get the lender's permission. And this was not figured out by the listing agent until the buyer had made an offer and it had been accepted. Right? Uh, right? So you, what I always used to do is I would look at whatever it was that they paid, whatever their original loan amount was, and assume it was the same now. Right, because most of the payments you make at the beginning are on principal, I mean, excuse me, are on interest and not principal. 
and if they've missed any payments, all of that is added to the principal. All right, ask questions of the listing agent to discover what's important to the seller. I would say what's important to the seller. My goal in writing an offer would be to write an offer that the seller could accept that they would not have to counter. This is not the market to write offers where you know that unless the listing agent is a moron, it's going to be countered. Right? I've seen, I talked to an agent and he said, well, I like to keep the loan contingency open until it's funded, right? which is a box you can check. I, and I told them, you will ne if I were the listing agent, you would never buy, because it basically means there is no financing contingency. And although that is good for the buyer, what you're betting on is that the listing agent is an idiot and they don't see it. Right? So did you understand, I would not assume, even if the listing agent is an idiot, I would not assume that you're going to sneak three things by, right? We're, we're in a multiple offer environment. You should write the offer so that the seller could accept it, right? That's what I'm, huh, huh? Find out their time frame. When, would, when do they want to close is a question I would ask. Sometimes it's soon, sometimes not soon because they're moving in the house they're moving to isn't ready yet. They don't want to. You can do seller rent backs and interim occupancy agreements, but those are painful, right? It's better to just have a nice clean close. Find out, in other words, one of the things that I would always have to counter as a listing agent was the closing date, because the buyer's agent never asked me when the seller wanted to close, right? So what you really want, we're going to look at a form, we're going to look at a form, and um, my suggestion was is to try to write in a date rather than a, a formula. 45 days, right? Well, what if, from what? From acceptance? What if that's Sunday? Well, then it won't close on that day, so we have to amend the contract. Mm, all right, do you understand? I'm lazy as a real estate. I don't want to have to amend contracts after they've been written, right? If you're going to close on Friday, that's a problem because sometimes something doesn't happen on time and then that means it's now the weekend and the title company is not closing on the weekend. If you try to close on Monday, it means the loan has to be funded on Friday, which means the buyers are going to pay interest for two days on a house that they do not own. And when they figure that out, they're not going to want to close on Friday. The walkthrough is done. The purchase agreement says three days, five days, you can write in a different amount before closing. Before closing. Right? Mr. Sibylla will go through that contract, but I'm going to show you ways for you to find out more so that you can do, you can be up on your game and ask him really hard questions. Right? All right. So, do you understand? You want to what things are important? The close of escrow, price, right? Which you know what the list price is. Find out their time frame, motivation. You might need to customize the buyer's offer. Uh, try to write the offer so that it can be accepted. Inquire about activity on the property. Now, the thing about number of showings. Sometimes you can tell because agents leave their business cards, right? When you go there, you look at them. I used to look through the cards. I used to do something else with the cards, which I'm not going to share at this point. But I would, what? No, no, I would, if I, I no, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Um, you should obtain, it says here, the seller's disclosure statement. That's a generic term. We mean the transfer disclosure statement. You want everything. Right, the purchase contract says is that the seller has seven days to cough up copies of everything they have. Then it says that the buyer has three days to read them and review them and decide if they want, like the house or not. So we're now up at ten days, and the whole it's better to get them first. Shouldn't you define whether they're business days or just consecutive? You know, days? We'll look at a contract. What is it? It, it says um, um, generally we're talking about calendar days for that. Yeah. Right, but it says in the purchase contract, there's a bunch. It's better to have them before you write the offer. <coughs> By the way, just I'm just saying this. The listing agent may not know this, 
But if your buyer reads about reads an inspection or report before they make the offer, then legally they cannot use what's in that report to back out during the inspection contingency. Any the, anything that the buyer the inspection contingency only applies to information learned after the purchase contract was entered into, not things that were known when the offer was made. Does that, does that make, did it, would I just say make sense? That means if your buyer wants to back out, hire the feng shui person to come and say that it's all messed up and that the spirits are unhappy and use that as a reason, right? But one of the other things I would tell sellers is, is if we get a termite in a property and a roof and a chimney and a foundation and all that stuff and we give it to the buyer, I, I would insist as a listing agent that before you wrote an offer, you, you signed a piece of paper, you got a copy of all the reports, and I wanted with your offer a receipt signed by you and your buyer that you have received and read all the inspections, reports, and disclosures before you wrote the offer. Right? I insisted on that as a listing agent because I knew anything that was contained in that documentation you could not use as an excuse to back out without losing your deposit. That's even if, if, even if, it's if you knew about it when you made the offer, the inspection contingency does not apply. You knew about it when you made the offer. It's like saying, I don't like the car because it's green. Well, you bought a green car. Yeah, but I've changed my mind. I don't like the car. It's green. Well, two, you, you knew it was green when you bought it. Yeah, but I've decided I don't like green, right? Do you understand? If you saw the termite report and there's Section 1 work, and then you just say, well, we don't like it because there's Section 1 work, you knew it when you made the offer. You can't use that. You have to be more creative. You say you went there at night. The family went there at night, and they didn't like them. It was too noisy, and they didn't like the people they saw on the street. You have to come up with something that's not in the inspections. Right? Do you understand, though, that this is something that's important for you to, to know? Because if you, I'm saying that if you represent the buyer, you want to get a copy of all this and go through it with them, you need to understand that if they make the offer knowing all that stuff, they can't use that to back out. So I had a client that I acquired, uh, but we had a, a termite inspection, and uh, it house was terribly infested with termites. She didn't like that inspection. So she said, well, I'm going to get another inspection. I fired her. I said, well, you still have to show this in, in the report, right? <clears throat> she said, no, we're not going to show that report. And I said, well, you're fired, basically. She went out, and she got another inspector. She hired another agent, and she covered up all the evidence that it was a termite-infested property. Well, that's the... So I always, make, I always have my clients do their own termite inspection now. Um, you can, by going to the State Structural Pest Control Board and paying a small fee and giving them the address, get a copy of any termite reports that have ever been issued on a property. Right? Any person, any person, whether you're actually involved in a transaction or real estate agent or not, any person can do this, right? which I'm just saying anybody can do this. Now, is it legal for the seller and the listing agent to hide bad termite reports? The answer is no. Does that mean that, they, that none of them have ever done that? No, it doesn't mean that, right? Some of them have done that. But all st state, they're licensed, state structural pest control operators, right? They're licensed and all their reports, all copies are on, I think you can get them online, right, if you have a credit card. Right? It's not, I don't know, what, don't ask me what the fee is, I don't remember, it's probably, and it's, but you could find out. What's the name of that organization? State. Structural, Structural Pest Control Board, Control. right? We're going to be doing a class probably in December on inspections and reports, and I'm going to have a termite person come in and talk. Yeah, they're, they're, oh, they're fun. I saw one guy, one guy, I was showing a house, and there was a guy sleeping on the couch, it was a termite inspector. There was a busy market, and he was taking a nap. Right. <laughs> and, and <laughs> anyhow, um, and and yes, different termite inspectors will find entirely different things. A note on making offers on distressed properties. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because we don't have as many REOs and things like that in short sales. 
And by the way, I, gosh, that would be hard. Let's say I'm really interested in how to make offers on short sales. And I like video training. Wow. There's overcoming lender resale restriction, short sale marketing, how to construct a successful offer on short sales. Hmm. Here's a really long one. How about if I, I actually did a seminar on how to make offers on REO properties, um, which I did not put on the, but there, you're going to, there's a bunch of them, right? And if you pay attention, you'll see lenders will be doing classes, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time about REOs and short sales because remember when we looked in them, there aren't as many of them. But, and have, is it clear how you could find information on how to do this? I just want to make sure. All right. We've also Shift, which is another book that you ought to pay attention to, which is on um, by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan, and it's about the shifting market. By the way, I we've we've I've been here in that market before. Do you understand? The last five years has not been the only times that we had short sales and REOs. All right. So guess what? It's going to happen again. Um, so I'm not going to spend, write the offer, keep these guidelines in mind and use the checklist on page 11. Again, it's talking about E-Edge and putting them into the loop. My recommendation, if you are new, is to hire a transaction coordinator. Right? Like Lindsay is. Like Lindsay is. How much does Lindsay charge, do you know? 350 for a buyer and 400 for a seller, I think. Yes, I think that's true. I thought that was just part of her Keller No, there's a fee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just told you. Mm -hmm. All right, the last time I did Ignite, and I, I had her come in and talk, um, but she doesn't talk for very long. And when you are new, it would be good to have, this comes out of the commission. That's right, do you understand? This is not, you don't have to write a check now. <laughs> and she knows what she's doing, and there's unlikely to be problems. Right. Yeah. Um, what's the expertise gain there? I mean, aren't you, as a new agent, shouldn't you learn how to work with these forms? Yeah, but this is like saying, uh, if you're a new doctor, do you want to practice on live patients, <laughs> right? Or would you like another doctor standing there to say, "Don't do that," don't. right? That so sort of thing. She's assisting in respect to getting all the. Forms. She's going to. She's going to say to you, you know, you don't have this form. The statewide buyer and seller advisory is not in the file, yeah, 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 you know, and, and that sort of thing. And um, um, most of the agents, especially those that are, most agents use a transaction coordinator. You are not obligated to use a trans transaction coordinator. You are not obligated to use her as a transaction coordinator. There are other people that do this, right? You could do it yourself. But I, on the first, you know, the first live patient that you're operating on, you might want, I'm just saying, right? I'm just saying. All right, so um, ensure that your buyer knows that all, these are some things, all checks are written at the same time are deposited upon acceptance. This will vary by area, right? Now, as a lazy, cautious, agent, maybe emphasis on lazy, um, they write a check, right, as a earnest money deposit. By the way, I would never have them write a check for more, what, what's the maximum small claims is now? Right, it's 75, 75, I think. So this is the initial deposit. The reason for that is, is that an exemption, an exclusion to arbitration and mediation is small claims court. And if we need to get the money back, I'd rather do it in small claims court, right? So yes. 7,500 7, is the new limit. So what I now, so they're going to write. Um, you should ask the. You might want to write that. You should ask the listing agent who's escrow with. Who's escrow with? What's the name of the escrow company? Because who's the check going to be made out to? The name of the escrow company which is usually a title company. And if you don't know, what do you do? Leave it blank. So you, as the agent, write 
it in for them later? Does that sound like a, are you supposed to be, I think altering a check is actually a criminal offense, right? It's a type of for, you know, no. so they have to write the check to the title company. What do you do if the listing agent won't answer the question because they're not available? You may find this hard to believe, but sometimes listing agents do not answer the phone or call back. I would have them write, giving space, title company, right? Space before the words title company, so they could write in the name of the title company later, right? You know? so, the, so the buyer writes the Buyer checks. writes their own checks. Helping the buyer write their checks gets you into trouble, <laughs> right? But who's writing in the name afterwards? They are. This is, I'm telling you what I would do, right? Which may be different from what Mike Sabella says, and if it is, do what he says. But I'm just telling you what I would do. I would have them write that on the end, you know, leaving, but you, the, what you really want to do is find out who the title company is. Right? You really want to know who the title company is. Is that on MLS? No. It might be in the fourth line. I would put it in when I was a listing agent, but, but not everybody does. You call the listing agent and ask, who's the title company? Where's the escrow? Tell me, please, All right? Now, the idea is you're supposed to make a copy of the check and include it with the offer, but you need to take out a big marker pen and remove all those numbers at the bottom of the check. The routing number, the account number, you know, all the things that somebody could use if they have a check writing program to make other checks with the right routing. Are there... Is there software you can, could you go to Office Depot to Staples, buy a stack of blank checks and a write a check program, right? And start making, and if you have all that, right? You, so you, it, when you, you block that out, right? You understand? The idea is not to fax, scan, and email to somebody all of their, no, you're not supposed to do that, right? Now, what I did, which may not be consistent with the policies of this office, I don't know, I would have them keep their check. I, I just wanted a copy. I wanted them to have the check. Because what I wanted them to do when the offer was accepted is I wanted them to take their check to the escrow company and give it to them. And then have the escrow company give them a receipt. I did this. By the way, a lot of buyers liked it. That they knew that they handed, and they got the receipt. Also, there's less paperwork for me in trust records, right? Because I didn't handle a trust. I didn't. Ha I, I was lazy and I didn't want to fill out that form, right? So if I don't have it, it's not a trust fund, and I don't have to write it down, right? And they liked it because they could go and do it. And plus, I didn't have to drive to the title company and deposit the check, or call the title company up and have them come and get the check or forget to do it and find it stapled to the outside of the broker jacket, which is what we call the folder, two weeks later and realize that I've committed a misdemeanor by not depositing it in three business days. Right? Nothing. You deposit it right away. I'm, that was a hypothetical oh, okay. situation, not a real What's one. What's the normal process if you accept the check? Do you have to get it to... It has, you have three business days. Pomona? You have, well, I, I, I'm not sure about that. The, the, we ask her everything. All right. Well, then take it, or Kelly at this office, or Mona, ask them. How about this? Ask them what they want you to do, right? But the, the thing is, is that we, I know that we don't necessarily put it into our trust account, right? It goes to escrow, right? And I've had buyers that wanted to take it to escrow. I tell them, take it to escrow. So, just to be clear, on the deposit, they shouldn't deposit more than 7500 I would Now, I wouldn't. It's 3% is the maximum that can be capped legally, and there's something called an uh, increased deposit and an RID-11, which is a receipt for an increased deposit. And so what I would do is I would give $7,500 up front, which is called an earnest money deposit, and then I would increase the deposit to 3% of the purchase price upon removal of the loan contingencies loan or other contingencies. Because until the contingencies are removed, they're not going to be able to keep anything anyhow. And as a list, if you said, well, we're going to give you a 10% deposit, I, the seller can only keep three as liquidated damages. Right? Right? 
that's called an uh, re so you give an initial deposit you if you want you could give three percent to begin with right. right then you don't have to do an increased deposit but if something goes wrong you can only go to small claims court for seventy five hundred dollars which means you have to go to arbitration to get the money back right these are just issues however depending on the market ask your mca for assistance how about that i should have just said that um bring your laptop or tablet computer with you when you meet with your client to review the offer um one of the things we have those nice big screens right by the way, let me just, um, when your buyer makes an offer, they're essentially selling themselves to the homeowner. A cover letter makes you, all right, so what oftentimes ha is good is that if you write a little letter, maybe with pictures, explaining why your clients like the property, but you need to be careful. All right, in other words, you're still supposed to be representing the buyer's best interest, and if you say they're really desperate, they've <laughs> got to have this one. Right. Their children said they're going to kill themselves if they don't get this house. We'll go to any length to buy it. Right? You understand? You don't do that. But I've had I I had a um, I had a listing once where I I double ended it. There was other issues like somebody died in the listing during the list. It, it was it, there were some other issues, but. Um, um, my client is looking at the offers and the offer that I had was not the highest offer, but he was a rich old guy that had inherited from his brother that died and he was asking me about my clients and it was a guy, the husband had just gotten out of the Air Force, he flew jets in the original desert storm, he had just gotten married, his wife was pregnant and he wanted to start a family and he said sell it to them. Right, even though, well, money wasn't important. He was in his 80s. He didn't care, right? So do you think that might happen, that somebody might want their home to go to a good family, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. Right, you think that's true? Yeah, because right. that's how I got one house. That's how you got one. I've made, I wrote a letter. And if you don't have a, a nice, what you do is you Google search images and get some pictures of some cute kids. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. Family photos, you know. That. All right. So um, you're going to want to summarize your offer. You should not assume it's best if you can present it yourself. It's best if you're there to talk to the seller directly. A lot of times that's not possible, right? Just because we don't do it as much as we used to and they're not going to let you do it. Not sometimes. So if you can't be there to explain why they ought to sell to your client, you might want to write a letter because you shouldn't assume that the listing agent is going to figure this out on their own. Short bullet list why this offer is good. Humanize, right? That's where you talk about the people. Photos of the client. Agents, by the way, can you make videos? Can you make a video? Can you make a video? Yes. Right? Right? Do you understand every, I wouldn't, do, how bad do your, do your people want the house? Right? Right? Make a little video. Um, don't disclose private or confidential information. Highlight the, why your offer is the best. Have you made videos before? Um, when I was selling real estate, we didn't have video. It was VHS tapes, beta. I had a Betamax recorder. No, on with um, dim lighting and studio. Yeah, that's right, and that, that music. Um, and I have it, Leslie Lang. One of the things that agents oftentimes invest in when they get going is something like a flip camera, right, which is a little portable USB um, connecting little video camera which has a decent microphone for a lot of reasons, but you could take videos with a smartphone. All right. Uh, Sean, Sean, how about that? Mega agent, buyer specialist in Denver, Colorado, often asks his buyers to write their own cover letter to the sellers. Um, they un, and, like I've, I've seen them where they had the children write little letters with their big stubby pencils on large line. Uh, huh? yeah. yeah, this creates an emotional attachment. Uh, well, how bad do you want it? 
A good example came from Judith White when she was working with a, very, a woman who was looking for a home for herself and two boys in wheelchairs with special needs. You, she was looking for a home for a year and a half, everything. There were multiple offers. She knew. We saw the house. It was very dated, but it had everything the buyer needed for the two boys with muscular dystrophy. We wrote a long letter with the offer explaining why they really needed this house. They got the house, even though we found out later that there were six offers and theirs was the fourth best. Even if it wasn't the highest offer, the grandfather who was going to a nursing home was so excited that these boys were going to have the home because they really needed it. All right? Checklist for writing an offer. Price and terms. What you, seller's disclosure, conveyances. What, um, what you might want to do is go to the California Association of Realtors page, log in. By the way, for those of you that like extra credit for studying, which I'm sure that this is a, you look like that kind of a group. Um, once you're a member of the California Association of Realtors, what you want to do is you go here to legal, see that? Legal Q&As by title, by category. And if you click on by category, you're going to find, um, let me see, do they have a section on contracts? Wow, they do, including buyer brokers, contingencies and contingencies, movable contract law. That's, I know it's old, but they don't change it that much. The counter offer form, I would read that one. Um, I'm sure that Mike's going to talk about it. Liquidated damages, options is not so much. Property transaction book, then uh, seller list, uh, seller property questionnaire. Um, that one is a standard form. Uh, as is the, there's all sorts of fun stuff, right? But let's just what I would recommend that you do. And remember, we're going to have a class on this. But the way you would find us is you go to zip forms and you go to access now. And anyway. Da, 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 da. All right. Now, my, um, I'm not, I, for those of you that have never seen this, um, what I would recommend that you do is you create, I don't like saying a dummy client because you'll meet them sometimes, but a, um, a buyer and a seller and go through and start. So I actually have one here. And um, I just, because I'm lazy, just did one. And um, I'll explain what I mean by, by that. But you might want to have all of the forms that would be, that you would use in a listing. In other words, you can create a client right now with, without even having one, right? And you would put all of the listing forms in, a, in that folder and I would read them and maybe you know, look at them. And the first thing that you're going to see for buyers or sellers is something called the cover sheet. And this is going to save you the most amount of time. This is going to save you a lot of time. Now, they do ask questions for things that you aren't ever going to use. But um, the idea would be that you would fill out as much of the information as possible. You may not need the cell phone number, they're not gonna, yeah, but, but anyhow, um, this would, see this, ch check this box if you would like an X to appear on all signature and for, the, for this buyer. Now, the, what we're doing here, if we fill out the cover sheet, it'll populate all of the other forms with that information. If you don't fill out the cover sheet, you're going to be typing in the name of the buyer one, buyer number number two, the property number. You're going to be doing it on every single form. Or you could do it one time here, and it will be on all of the forms. Right? Now, you, people are asking about a sample. They, they don't make it easy for you to, you can print out samples and it says sample. But if you want to study the form, what you want to do is to do what I'm just saying, right? And go through and make up numbers. And I have one, I have a seller, Sammy and Susie Seller, at Happy Home Drive, right? And, um, and then this, I haven't because I was lazy and just didn't want to do all of it. You don't need to put in the legal description. You know, track four, block six, I mean, you know, lot form, lot, you don't need to do that. The tax ID number, don't worry about that. Assessor's parcel number, there's an occasional form that has that. 
Um, the listing date, listing price, and expiration, this is a one-size-fits-all cover sheet, so that would be for listings. Um, balance of the first and the second mortgages, if you were listing, you would want to do this. But you can do a net sheet for a seller off of this form, right? Other liens. This, by the way, is not a good, not a bad template to have when you're talking to the seller. All right. And then if you fill out all these fees, homeowner, are, are they going to ask you what the homeowner association dues are? Absolutely. Yeah. So you're going to want to fill out all of this, right? Document. And by the way, the documentary preparation fees and thing, another transfer taxes. That's for doing the net sheet. You don't necessarily have to do that, but the you when you're working with a seller, you want to have the MLS data sheet. There's a class one for single family and a class two, and that'll tell you. You should read this. All the information that they want you to have for the MLS. And, and so anyhow, we want so look at this part, purchase price. We're going to write in, this, by the way, is the price being offered. How many, do I have enough zeros? All right. Yeah, that looks like uh, five, five million. How about that? Let me, uh, let me remove a zero. How about that? All right. And um, the agreement date, this is the date that you're writing the contract. Right? So the contract has a date. That isn't the date of acceptance. The date of acceptance is when the last signature necessary to form a binding agreement appears. So if there's a counter and a counter and a counter, but still they refer to the contract, the contract date tip. Right? But that's not the same as acceptance. Is, this, is that clear what I'm saying? The closing date, right? Of course, it would be good if you talked to the and had one. But if you put it in here, it'll populate the other forms. Deposit amount, $7,500. How about that? Right? A first increase. What you would do if you were doing the increased deposit is you would take the purchase price times five, Multiply it to 500,000 times 0.03 is 15,000. Subtract 7,500, and that would be another 7,000. Oops, back. 500, right? Isn't that 3%? Mm -hmm. All right. And offer date would be today, and the expiration date. And notice this little box here. You click on it, right? Because maybe you're doing the typing now, but you know you're not going to talk to them until Saturday, right? And the expired date is a, the standard one says the seller has three days or something like that. You can change it. But this means when it expires and what time. Time is of the essence if they accept that after this expiration term you don't have an agreement. This is when they've accepted it, the amount financed. The reason that you'd put this in is it's going to fill in the form for you. The property type. And year built and some of this stuff doesn't necessarily, there isn't really a use for this. Escrow information is good to put in because remember you want to know all this if you can. The transaction cover sheet, you're going to want to put in the information for the office and the agent on the other side. So this would be the listing broker if you're writing an offer. And if you want to put all this, you can, but, um, you know, you, I don't, I'll put in everything, but you might want to put, you, you want email addresses if you're using the electronic signatures, that's how they send the forms to other people. Um, your lender information, and you probably at this point later, you can put in appraisal and title and pest control and other disclosure and home warranty and homeowner association. Um, I'm not saying that I filled out every single line, but I filled out a lot of that. All right, and what I'm going, what I'm doing is I'm hitting save. All right, did everybody see that? This is an important thing to do. Transaction is saved. Here is their e-signature, which is digital ink, which isn't that 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 useful. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to go back to open, and no, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me cancel that. How come I always have this problem? All right, so we're going to go to forms, and I'm going back here. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and made copies of 
a whole bunch of forms, right? And you don't necessarily want to do everything that I've done, but there's the residential purchase agreement, the purchase agreement addendum, the uh, RPA is the residential purchase agreement, and so, um, which is here someplace, anyhow. The, so what you can do, if you want to, is notice it says save as a PDF. I've actually put in like everything that I was even remotely interested in, hit save as a PDF, and that I put it on Google Drive, and my tablet PC, which has a reader, means that I could read the documents when I have insomnia right at night. And by the way, what agents will, I, I hear this like at meetings, somebody will say, will ask a question, you know, and to the broker, and 99% of the time it's answered in the agreement, right? Read the contract, right? That's what the broker's gonna say, read the contract. Why don't you just read, you know, read the contract? Right. Does that does er, does does everybody see what I, you know? If you fill that out, you might as well just fill it out and read through it and read through some of the legal things, right? I'm just my that's my suggestion. You can create templates for buyers and sellers that have your information and other stuff in it. So you understand? So if you're the listing agent, do you want to type in your name, your office, the office address, your email address, your phone? Do you want to do that every time you write a listing? Probably not, right? So you make a template and you fill out all your information, right? For listing and you do another template for buying and you put in all of your information. Also, that you could put in all of the forms that you would normally use on a listing and all of the forms you would normally use on a buyer, and you make that a template so that when you click on it and you open it up, all those forms are there, and you're not having to scroll through the 150 or whatever it is forms and pick out the ones you want. You do it one time. It also has, I'm not, my goal is not to teach you how could you possibly find out more about this. So I clicked on help how-to videos. Oh my gosh. Do you mean the company that makes these forms has videos explaining how to do all this? This is another thing you need to learn. Huh? Right? Huh? Right? All right. So, uh, earnest money, time for acceptance, the buyer pro loan approval, closing date, home warranty. You should have one. Now, when you are a, a seller, uh, when, is that automatically just included? Or I think it is in California. Isn't it? it should be. By the way, one of the things that, you know, I'm going to have a home warranty company come in and explain the home warranty to you because it's not as simple as you think. Plus, as a listing agent, I would explain there's something called seller's coverage. And what it means is, is that if something breaks during escrow, that they can call the home warranty company and for a minimum fee, they'd come out and fix it. And it's like 20 or 30 cents a day, right, for the warranty. And then I, I actually have had clients say, no, I don't think so. I make them initial the home warranty card saying no they don't do it and several times when they've said no something broke that would have been covered under the home warranty and you know but you understand if I didn't talk to them about this and something broke and they told a friend and the friend said well what about your home warranty well what do you mean a home warranty that's for the buyer well no there's one for the seller too and you didn't even mention it to them you understand you might be in trouble so just for period? For the listing. For the close. Right. Okay. Now, um, I've seen agents, that's what they give their seller, their buyer, something that they give. Is that? I didn't do that. I've never paid for a home warranty in my life. Because we used ours. I mean. I know, I've never paid for a home warranty. All right. I haven't either. That's All right. Okay. Yeah, it's not, we're not talking about a lot of money, and it's billed to escrow. Usually what happens is the seller will pay 
for um, usually what you would do, and, and I'm not going. I'm not. My goal today isn't to write a contract with you, but usually what what I would do is I would say that I, I would know what a good home warranty cost for the basic, and I would I would say buyer's choice, but the, it says seller to pay for a home warranty not to exceed you write in an amount. But there are certain additional coverages, air conditioning and other certain things that would probably be a good thing for a buyer to have, right? And so sometimes the buyer will pay the difference, right? I'm gonna have a home warranty co person come in and explain this to you. It's not as simple as you think. It's a lifesaver. It's a lifesaver. It also lowers errors in emissions insurance sometimes. Right, it cuts down on problems, but I almost always got my sellers to pick a home warranty company and start the coverage during the listing period. All right, okay. Um, common obstacles to writing an offer we're going to take a few minutes, and because I'm tired of talking, right, you can tell I get worn out easily. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to we're on page 913 and we're going to do a short little practice about when the buyer wants the seller to make repairs. And so what we're just going to do it's good for you to get in the habits of practicing these scripts. And so what we're going to do is one of you are going to be an A and the other person is going to be a B. All right? And so then the A person will go first and then the B person will go second, and we're going to do the first one, so we're each going to do one of the first one about the repairs and one on the second one about the offer, and we're going to start now. There's an even number of people, and those two can't get broken up. I know that, so that would mean just the rest of you can figure it out for yourself. All right? We already have partners. All right, so you have partners. Those, all right? All right? This is when I met you. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? Good. I didn't know you didn't have a copy. I'm, I just yeah. plow ahead.
All right. How are we doing? I'm just going to say, I'll call him. If I don't get satisfaction, I'm going to be back to you. Good. <laughs> that was a real thing. Yeah. That was real? Yeah. And, uh, that's when I met Mike. Uh -huh. So did they really not water the grass? No, no, the grass was taken care of, but there was one given. So it was good. Yeah. And uh, so part of the grass by the road was the the highway in Iowa, not why it was an inspector. All right. Let's, um, I know you guys, I, I, let's, let's focus again. Come back. All right. Under, let, let's go ahead. Come on, come on, come on. 914, I know. It's like hurting cats. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, any any comments from that? She was good. She was good. Yeah. You you were a brat. Uh, so it's. You just give them solutions. Right. You give them solutions to the problem. You you use the problem. Yeah. But you, bottom line was the buyer had never bought a house before. He had no idea what the deal was. He thought he was still the landlord. So he could call this person to come and fix it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's called the home warranty. Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you know what? I think the thing, when people are feeling irritated, mm -hmm. I think they really just want somebody to, to listen to yes. them. And, and, and commiserate with them and give them solutions. Yeah. And you give them solutions and then it's okay. And I've driven Is, all over town to pick up like lamps or something. That we have you, one of the things we have to keep in mind, whether we represent the buyer or the seller, that if we're representing the buyer, this is probably the biggest investment they have ever made right. in their lives. Yeah. 
And if we represent the seller, this is them liquidating, in a sense, the largest asset they have, right? And also when you throw in the home, house, family, um, it can become a very emotional, um, it can become very emotional. Present, we're on to presenting the offer because I want to be done at 11, all right? And it says, call the listing agent immediately, let you know an offer is coming. Using eEdge, invite the listing agent into the buying loop. So you can submit the offer with for electronic signature. Old school would be you'd want to be there to present it. That's really hard these days. I really want to do that. I know that. But as a listing agent, I wouldn't. Really? Right. I, I, because I had 15 listings, and I knew that if I let every agent come and present their offer, it was going to take forever and if I had eight, let's say, offers on a listing and all eight agents showed up and they would want to talk for an hour to an hour and a half and it would just be, and I didn't, I, and I would say no. But will people let you do it now? Some will, but most won't. Because, you know, one of the things that I like to say is, when I'm a listing agent, is what kind of real estate agent that, is that, that, that there are, I, I, I'm with you, it's better to be there in person to present the offer. I'm, you, I'm with you on that. I thought if you really had something, you had to be there in person. It, it's, it's, you should, best practice would be to be, try to be there in person. I'm just telling you that many listing agents are going to resist that. Sometimes sellers will resist it, right? You know, because they don't want it to go on for so they want to look at the documents. But it would be better. And, and the idea about whether or not you're allowed, I've actually had people say, well, when are you meeting with the seller? Mm -hmm. Right? And well, are you going to be meeting at your office? All right, well, can I just drop it off? Like, you know, right, can I just drop it off there? And then they would then, I've had people would do this to me. And then when they were there, the agent would say, well, since I'm here, yeah. you know, I mean, it will only take a few minutes and I knew they were lying, right? <laughs> you know, because I've never seen a real estate agent take a few minutes explaining their offer. But, um, but, but do you understand if you really want to do it, you try to drop it off when they're meeting with the clients. And, you know, in the old days, there were people who used to insist you know, and I, I had clients, I had a client, the seller was in Shanghai, and I would say, well, this is going to be hard, right, you know, because she's not here. So, but, but whether or even if you're managing to get in and present the offer yourself, you should still um, invite the listing agent into eEdge because there's going to be pieces of paper later that are going to need to be signed. Right? There's going to be addendums and extensions and contingency removals and a whole bunch of stuff. And even if you want the offer to be presented in person, you're not going to want to have to drive over all that stuff and fax it and scan it and do all that. It's a whole lot easier to do it through the system. Request a reply within the shortest amount of time. Ask when they're likely to get back. If the seller counters, consult with your buyer to either accept the counter offer or to re-counter. Um, you should explain current marketing conditions. When you represent a seller, um, there are four actions you need to receive it, gather information about the buyers, present the offer to your clients, and respond. Receiving it, um, you know, I, I had stopped using a fax machine a long time ago, but some agents still do. And the reason that I, I had a scanner, right? And our office has nice scanners. All those, those copiers will scan. Um, I used to have, in fact, I still have it at home, a under $100 uh, all-in-one printer scanner. And I could put in over 20 pages in this document feeder, and it almost always scanned each one perfectly. Right. And so that would send, mean sending an email or something like that. But you have to receive it. Um, gather information about the buyer. How long is the buyer? These are questions you might want to ask. Why did they select a property? Have they seen this property? You would think, well, of course they have. They're making an offer. No, not necessarily. They may be making, sometimes, especially in this market, because we have multiple offers, 
buyers are making offers on five or six homes at once, right? Because they don't expect them all to be accepted. And they haven't necessarily saw them all. And so what the idea is, is, is that they'll just back out of the ones that if they get, what if they're all five accepted? Well, they'll just back out of four. Right? Huh? Right? So if sellers are getting multiple offers, then buyers are making multiple offers. Do, do you understand if you're the listing agent, should you tell your clients that that's possible? Right. So would it be better if you've had a conversation with the agent who represents the buyer about the buyers and whether or not they're really interested in buying this home? Have you, I would ask, have you made offers on other homes? Sometimes agents will say, yeah, we made three. Thank you. Right. Um, so have they made offers on any other properties? What happened? Have they been pre-approved? Do they have anything to sell? Now, that's going to have to be in the, are they from out of town? Why are they moving to this area? The more you know about them, the better prepared you are for the seller to respond. The idea is to respond to a buyer with a high likelihood of knowing that the response will be taken. So remember, we want to write an offer if we represent the buyer that the seller can accept. And if we're a listing agent, we want when we accept the offer, we want it to be a contract that's going to close. And just because somebody has made an offer does not mean they intend on buying the house. I know that sounds weird, but just because they've made an offer does not mean they intend on buying the house. All right? They think it's like an option. Right? The money, the check, which they sent you a Xerox of, has been deposited nowhere. And if it says blank title company, then that check could have been used on eight offers that one day. Right? One of the things that I would look at, because I would always say in line four, line four is the comment line, agent to agent comment line on the MLS. I would always say the name of the title company. And if they just had blank title company, it made me wonder whether or not this was being used on more than one title company. Because if they were using it on my title, why didn't they write an Old Republic title? Why did they just have it blank? Because they're using the check for many different offers. I see, we have a check. See, see, see. All right? That doesn't mean that they're. I think I, I know I beat things to death, but that you, you understand that's a real issue right now. Yes. Oh, by comment? What do you mean? Well, comment means, I, like, yes, you show us the, uh, oh, you can go to listing information. Then we can put the secret, the comment. Oh, yeah. The buyer came, but offered, but actually. The, the line number four is a very limited number of spaces. Well, so you, can. you can't just write whatever you want. It's a really limited number of spaces. It's about that long. On, yeah. So, and you see, the way that this, this usually happens is, you know, you're, you're new, you're, you're not cynical, you're impressionable, uh, you're showing homes, they write an offer, there's 10 offers, it's not accepted. They write another offer, there's 10 offers, it's not accepted. They write another offer, there's eight offers, it's not accepted. Pretty soon, you, you become a little more hardened, right? And you say, well, why don't we, there's five that have come on the market today, why don't we just write up an offer on all five of them, you know, and ship them in as fast as we can and see which one, you know, we get. And if we don't get them all, well, we won't like something about the other ones, right? If we get more, if all of them accept, we just won't like something about four of them, right? When we, right? We'll say, oh, wow, that we looked at the termite report. You don't have any termites. And we, <laughs> we, and that's a problem because uh, we like there to be abundant wildlife, you know, around the house. So we're not. We like the smell. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, but, but does everybody understand you? One of the reasons why you need to, you should, you should come to team meetings 
is because you can under you can hear what's going on in the market, right? Because if you don't, if, if, you know, how would you know that the people are doing this? Oh, well, you know, I talk to agents all the time, right? This is how I know that it's being done. All right, checklist for the address. Make sure the address is uncorrect. I've actually gotten them where they sent me the wrong one, right? Not only did I know, I mean, they were making them on four or five, and they sent me the wrong one. And I called the agent up, and I said, you know, um, you, know you should, you know, I know you were probably faxing a bunch of them at once. Price, earnest money. Now, time for acceptance. This is what Mike's going to go through. Right, because he's going to uh, it as a um, agents would bring me their offers. It would take me minutes to review them before. If, so if you had one and you said I want somebody to look at it, if you show it to me, it would take it takes me just a couple of minutes to read an offer because I know exactly where to look for the things that are messed up. Right? Do you understand? And most of the form, there's nothing you can do to mess up. But there are certain, there's only certain things where you can put stuff in or leave stuff out, right? And so all I have to do as a manager is look at those things, right? And I usually take a yellow, I t give me a copy and I take a yellow highlighter and I go through and I mark stuff, right? And usually it's things that are not filled out or something is filled out wrong or a box that's not checked or the wrong box is checked, right? That's, it doesn't take very long to do it. But I have seen a lot of them, right? You understand? So um, if you're writing an offer, if you have a mentor, you're, you could, they'll help you if I would be happy to look at it. Your team leader would be happy to look at it. It doesn't take us very long to read a contract. Right? It doesn't take very long. Right? But you would want that, you're going to want somebody to do this. Homeowner association and mold disclosures. I'm, we're going to be doing a class on disclosures. I'm going to do a class on disclosures, I guess. And we're going to have um, inspectors come in. But the HOA, if you're the listing agent, your obligation is to give the documents to the buyer's agent. If you're the buyer's agent, it's your obligation to read them and explain things to the buyer. All right? I had a buyer buying a condo, a townhouse up in Almaden. And um, they give you the homeowner association documents. And the things that I would always focus on are the meeting minutes of the Homeowners Association, the Homeowners Association newsletters, the bylaws, because a lot of bad stuff is usually in the bylaws, and the financials. And I'm reading the Homeowners Association minutes, and they start talking about wild pigs. There's wild pigs up there. And they're, 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 having, they're arguing, they're fighting about wild, the wild pig problem. And I keep reading the Homeowner Association minutes, and they formed a wild pig committee, right, <laughs> on the Homeowner Association, right? How would you like to, that would look good on your resume, <laughs> that you were in charge of the wild pig. They hire, and I'm re, I keep reading this, they hired a wild pig trapper, right? I didn't even realize this was a potential career, right, you know, <laughs> that I could, I could actually be a wild pig trapper. They caught like more than a dozen wild pigs one weekend. Do you understand? We're not talking about a, a pig here and a pig there. Everywhere. We're talking pig, pig everywhere, right? <laughs> now, what I would do is I would take out a highlighter, and when I would read these things, I would highlight them, and onto the side, I would draw a little spot for my client to initial, right? And I would show it to them, and I would, and they, by the way, just, I told them they had a teenage son. And I promised to buy him a crossbow if they bought the townhouse. And there was a large barbecue. You know, yeah. And, and so she decided not to buy it. Right? But, but you understand that I, I would mark things that looked interesting. And the, there was, you don't want to know what, anyhow, there was evidence of the wild pig infestation. So you would have your client, you would read it and have them initial next to it. No, there's other okay. other evidence of wild pigs. All right. So, so the um. But but you understand that you, another case. I'm the listing agent, and I sell a condo, and the buyer moves in, and um, within one week of escrow closing, they got a bill from the homeowners association, an eight thousand dollar assessment. Right, and so the buyers were really well perturbed. And the 
their agent called me, and he was really perturbed, saying that we had failed to disclose this. And he said, did you, and he's asking me about the Homeowner Association documents, and I said, I haven't read them. I'm the listing agent. The listing agent doesn't have to read them. I said, the problem is you got a copy of them, and I'll bet you, and you put them in your file, and you didn't read them. Do you understand? He represents the buyer, not me. As the listing agent, it is not my job to read the homeowner association documents and mark the bad things for him to show to his clients. Not my job. Whose job is that? The agent who represents the buyer. And I said, this is not a case where we did not disclose it. This is a case where we did, and you didn't bother to read it and explain it to your clients. Hmm? Well, where the homeowner association, you you want to read the there's the meeting minutes of the last two years of the homeowner association. That's where all the juicy stuff is. Because and I said to this guy, I said, you got a copy of the last two years of the meeting minutes. Do you think they discussed this upcoming assessment? You think there were fist fights at the homeowner association meeting about this assessment, right? They've been talking about it probably for a year, right? Arguing and fighting about it. So if you read that, you have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Then there's a newsletter. They report things like break-ins, assaults. Hey, watch out. There's a burglar in the neighborhood. Then the bylaws. The bylaws are the ones that say you can't change your landscaping and you can't put the drapes of the color that you want in the windows. The forms right. you have to fill up, the architectural. Right, and the architectural committee. And then the financials, because if they don't have any money, they're going to have assessments. Bylaws and CCC. CCNR is, that's a, a musical group from the 70s. It's called CCNR. That too. That too. But, but it's, the whole thing is about, but, but you understand what I'm saying is that if you were right, if, if you got a copy of this, would you want to read it? I mean, you're not going to read the whole CCNRs, right? I'm just telling you, you're not going to, right? You, um, but, but you're not going to, right? I'm sure. I mean, you might have, I, I could never make it through all of them. But if you read those things, you've at least covered the, the most important parts. I guess I shouldn't say don't read the CCNRs. But I like to read the dirt. The dirt. The Homeowner Association minutes are the, are the that's where the good and stuff is. don't read all the, <clears throat> and something happens, they're going, when you go to court, they're going to ask you if you did. Yeah, I know, but most of the CCNRs are, are the declaration of restrictions and they're just standard stuff. I can tell them without reading them that they're not allowed to have a business. <laughs> right. I can I can tell them without reading them that they can't um, materially change the landscaping without going to the committee. I can tell them that they can't change the door without. I mean, I can tell them. I already know that that's what it says. All right. All right. Present the offer to your client. First, call your client. Let them know you have an offer. Immediately inform them of the offer price and the closing date so they can think about it. Right? Some people, there's differences of opinions on that. I, I'll, I'll go with this one. Because they'll say, tell me. Tell me what is it, how much? And if you say, I'm not going to tell you. You have to come here, and then I'll tell you. I never, you work for them. Right? Yeah, right? And if they asked me, I would tell them. How much? I would email them a copy. Because it's a scanning thing. Right? I would like them to spend some time reading it. By the way, one of the things that I would always do with sellers is I would take one of those sample contracts and I would print one out with, and I would give them a copy so that they could read it during the listing period, right? A sample. So they could read it before we get an offer. So they're not saying, well, what's this mean, right? If they have questions about the contract, I would rather do it before we have an offer. If possible, present the offers in person. This is if you're the listing agent. Bring your laptop computer, we'll do it online. I usually would get them to come into the office. Why? We have computers with big screens. We have good printers. We have high speed scanners, right? And there's, you know, there's people there to, to protect you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We have high speed scanners and fax machines and staplers and a whole bunch of stuff. Right? If you go to their house, you may not even have an internet connection. Right? So I would come to the office. Plus, I was a lazy agent. 
right? I had a big table, right? I don't come to the office. I had a big screen, right? Well, you know, I mean, you, when you have, you see, you're, you're my, if, if um, does the doctor make house calls? No. Does the lawyer come to your house? How about your CPA? Right? No? They don't do that? Doesn't the CPA come by you? If you say, well, it would be better if you came here. No way. Right? I think, no. All right? So I would have them come to the office because, you know, just especially if there's a lot of them, you want a big table. Yeah. Now, is that part of the rationale behind having an open house and then saying offers can be presented up to this date so you can kind of get them all out of the way? Well, the idea is, is you want to create demand, right? There's the, the, if you had a, a clearance sale and you said half off, would you say when it ends? And by doing that, you want to get them all in at once so you can present them all at once. Right. You don't want them dribbling in, right? You want them all at once. And I've had like a, more than a dozen at a time, and you end up stacking them, right, based upon price and things like that. And, and, and you're supposed to show them all, but the seller would say, I don't want to, you know, that group I don't even want to look at. You're the ones that are below the list price. Oh, forget it. Right? Here are the ones that are at list price, and here are the ones that are above list price. And they usually say, let's start with those. Right? And then, you know. Um, and, and so anyhow, um, I would try to get them to come into the office to do this. But I've sold a house while the owner was in Shanghai. Right? Closed, he signed everything. Right? This, by the way, we didn't have e-signatures, but guess what? They have fax machines and computers. And did you know that in Shanghai they have computers and fax machines and phones and everything, right? And so um, keep the tone of the conversation. Never criticize the buyer, the buyer's agent, you know, because you might have to make a deal with them later. <laughs> Explain it. Uh, discuss time on the market, number of showings, an updated CMA. You should have an updated CMA. That's a good idea. Right, because the market may have changed a lot since the last time you talked to them about pricing. All right, and they, you know, I've gone, I, I would already have gone through the purchase agreement with them, so there are certain things they care about. How much? What kind of financing? When do you close? Are they asking me to fix anything? How long are the contingencies? Right? That's what they care about, right? If you start to read every line to them, well, this says time is of the essence, and what that means is, is that it's a, essence is a French word, and it means that the heart, right? You know, I'm mean, like, you know. Um, so, reach a decision. They can accept, they can counter, or reject. You would, if they're not going to accept it, you would want them to try to counter, um, which means that they're making an offer to the buyer. Um, you can do something called a multiple counteroffer. This is a good thing, right? I don't know if Mike is going to go through counteroffers. I, I, I assume he will. But you can counter five offers at once by using either the same piece of paper or five different pieces of paper. And there's a bot. We're going to go through this, but was there a California Association of Realtors Legal Q&A on the counteroffer form? The answer is yes, right? The counteroffers get a little bit tricky. I have a little checklist, but that's not my end of the stick. Um, what I'm, we're going to, you, since you all have your um, script partners, don't you? Or, or well, we're going to, we're going to save that one for tomorrow because I'm sure you're all meeting on Saturday to practice your scripts, right? Um, you respond to the offer. Notify the buyer of the, your decision. Yeah, I always started with the one we accepted and then told the rest. Um, if the buyer accepts the counteroffer, have the buyer change his um, a signature. There is a receipt for there is a receipt for communication of acceptance. So buyer makes an offer to the seller. Seller accepts it and sends it back. There's another part where the agent and can initial that they've gotten the communication of the acceptance. It says that that's not a requirement for the contract to be binding. But when the acceptance has been communicated and received is when you have a binding agreement. 
and having their initials saying that they got your acceptance is a good thing to have. But if you read the form, it's not a requirement. Um, you're in escrow. All right. Um, positive negotiation. Customer service. For, this is the W14, WI4C2TS. The W. By the way, I'm going to, one of the business cards I'm looking at ordering has this on the back just because I want people to go, huh? The W means win-win or no deal. I, integrity, do the right thing. The C, the four C's, customers, commitment, communication, creativity. The two T's, teamwork and trust and success. Um, e, edge, it, this system means that somebody that responds to an internet ad and becomes a lead can move from the status of being a lead to a contact. And then from a contact, you can go to my marketing and market stuff to them. And then you can launch action plans to follow up with them. And when they buy or sell, they move into the my transactions. And without you having to re-put all this information, it's a transaction coordination in a sense or tracking system built into eEdge. I would still hire a coordinator. Just saying. Lindsay gives me $5 if I... All right. So we've done this part. You're going to get the work. Action plans. Oh, my gosh. They always have one of these. I guess that's sort of like homework assignment. Um, practice the scripts. You should decide when you're going to do these things. Find resources. Complete my transaction self-study lessons, eEdge 101 training guide on mykw.com. Attend the training at the Market Center. I don't know when it is. Attend my transactions training online. That's all the time you can do that. And you're going to prepare for the next power session. Um, the next power session is going to be Monday, 9 to 11. On, there's going to be an accountability section and time blocking. And um, Kelly is going to be doing that class because she really likes time blocking. Plus, there's been so many complaints about my classes that, that they're going to bring in a substitute. Oh, yes. Monday. Kelly's going to do the class. So you're all the letters here, here, everything here. We're not changing anything. We're here. There's also... You might want to get a copy of the schedule for the training that's here, right? There's copies of the schedule, all right? Do 